Hello, good evening. Welcome to Join News Prime. Coming up tonight, a warning from the Ghana Telecoms Chamber that a continued cutting of fiber cables could worsen internet and core quality as it spends up to $6 million to fix these cables cut illegally across the country. I'm, I'm pretty sure some of you who know, who know that in 2020, for example, we spent $6 million in just repairing fiber that had been damaged. Also coming up, man, after John News launched the classroom project, work begins on a school structure that would accommodate up to 700 in the central region town of Bremen, Jamra. Joy News' coverage of the disaster moved non-governmental organizations to build the structure, which now houses some of the children. And Ghana's first skating park, where young people in the sport are hoping to build their carts for the world stage. We usually have a lot of problems using people's spaces because they are private spaces and they have problems with us skateboarding there, so we get kicked out most of the time. I believe that skateboarding I can definitely encourage youth entrepreneurship. And later in the bulletin, celebrating a hero, tribute sport in for general manager of Joy Brands, Elvis Kwashi, who passed on two days ago. We want to celebrate you while you are still alive. We have details of these stories and more here. Stay with us. My name is Ernest Mino. This bulletin is coming to you live from our studios at Fandofa. We are live on DSTV, Channel 421, Go TV 144. We are streaming on all our social media platforms. Tonight, the Ghana Telecoms Chamber is warning that the continued cutting of fiber cables could worsen internet and core quality. If not halted, the telcos have already spent about $6 million to fix these cables cut illegally across the country. Dr. Kenashibe is CEO of the Telecoms Chamber. The National Engineering Coordinating Team says it I'm, I'm pretty sure some of you who know, who know that in 2020, for example, we spent $6 million in just repairing fiber that had been damaged. A lot of the poor quality of service that you get is because somebody has damaged, damaged some fiber. And it's not only the, the, the telcos that I'm talking about. I gave you an example in Kumasi. Well, four kilometers of pipeline, Ghana water pipeline, was destroyed. If you ask uh, electricity, they will also tell you about the damage that has happened to them because of the fact that, you know, the, right, the reservations have been encroached. They are not able to stay where they are supposed to stay. And then they come into the carriageway when the roads are being done, then they are being destroyed. So as a country, we keep on spending money in the same places instead of extending it because of all these things. And no, it's not only that. We all know the number of lives that have been lost. You know, due to flooding because people have built in, you know, uh, you know, waterways and all of that. So the indiscipline as Ghanaians has to stop. And I think that one, this thing where those who are breaking the laws, you know, blackmail politicians, for us and next, we are not standing any elections. We would ensure that the right thing is being done. And when we do it, we don't have any political motive. It is about the country, it is about being professionals, and it's about doing what is right. Now, he said this when the National Engineering Coordinating Team, NECT, went on an inspection tour today. NECT has described as worrying and the negligence of some assemblies who are permitting individuals to encroach on portions of land reserved for future expansion of roads. But a visit to Ablekuma revealed that the assembly itself had built its office on a reserve land. And I'm talking about the Ablekuma North Municipal Assembly. Here's a report by my colleague Michael Ashali. The National Engineering Coordinating Team says it is championing advocacy to get people to stop building on areas like these. To the left of this place, there's a reserved land where government hopes that in the near future it may be able to expand this road. But as you can see behind me, the building of the assembly in itself. The next says this is very troubling for an assembly to commit such an illegality. The chairman of the coordinating team has been speaking to Joy News and says it's very expensive for government to come in to compensate individuals. This is right in the middle of the reservation. And then not only is it in the middle of the reservation, already you're beginning to see Judah Food Palace also come. And there are other buildings that are also springing up in the reservation. 
So for an assembly that is supposed to police the reservation, who have been written to in December 2020 on the 11th, that was the, when the first letter came, for them to have ignored and then moved from a temporal building to a permanent structure, and then they are seeing other, supervising other permanent buildings come again in the reservation, that's, that's definitely uh, a, a, cost, a major cause for worry. And this reservation is, a, as you all can see, it's a 150 feet reservation that has been left for quite some time now. And so for the assembly that is supposed to be policing this and ensuring that this is kept so that tomorrow, if government gets enough money and decides to expand this road, we are able to do that. But for the assembly to now take the reservation and also supervise others encroaching on the same reservation, it's very worrying. There can be no explanation of the fact that this is a new assembly and they are looking for land. Then the road reservation that is supposed to serve your people is the one you are building on and then you are pretending others also encroaching on the reservation. They have, you see, the point about it is that this definitely is an illegality. This definitely is going to compound the problem of the people of uh, Ablekuma North. Because what is going to happen is that you see already that others are following the bad example. And then if you are somebody who uses this road, you know that the traffic is just going to get worse. So definitely the solution to this, unfortunately, is a very expensive one. This building would have to be taken out. On the other option is for government to then say, we have enough money and then we are going to build a flyover over this particular structure. And your, your guess is as good as mine. This portion of land, like many, are supposed to be reserved land close to some major routes in the country where government intends to expand the roads accordingly in the near future. But as you can see, new structures are coming up along it. And this particular stretch was supposed to be reserved with no building on it. But that is not the case. A rep from the Urban Roads Department on the National Engineering Coordinating Team has been speaking to us and says that this certainly must not be encouraged. We have a bill of about 100 million to be paid to individuals for very few projects. I was in Pokwase, uh, Pokwase Interchange, Beach Road, very few projects. The approval we have from land valuation is over 100 million. And a lot more are coming. Every month they meet, a lot more are coming. This can be prevented with good planning and implementation of the planning and development control. We should be able to minimize this cost to the whole state. If a, a land has been reserved as road, let's just go by that. Let's leave the road reservation for the development of the road many attempts to get the assembly to respond to this has proven futile including several letters that are written by the urban roads department and that of the coordinating team the challenge is not just with the department of urban roads entities like the chamber of telecommunications also pays millions of dollars to get some of their cables that are destroyed in the course of construction of these roads ken ashikbe who also doubles as their national chair Spoke to us. I'm, I'm pretty sure some of you who know would know that in 2020, for example, we spent six million dollars in just repairing fiber that had been damaged. A lot of the poor quality of service that you get is because somebody has damaged damage some fiber. And it's not only the, the, the telcos that I'm talking about. I give you an example in Kumasi, where four kilometers of pipeline, Ghana water pipeline, was destroyed. If you ask uh, electricity, they will also tell you about the damage that has happened to them because of the fact that, you know, the, right, the reservations have been encroached. They are not able to stay where they are supposed to stay. And then they come into the carriageway when the roads are being done, then they are being destroyed. Clearly, government is spending a lot of money to get this done, especially when people willfully build on reserved road race. Reporting for Joy News, Michael Ashali. Now, the Greater Accra Regional Security Council has eased restrictions on beach activities or business. In a review meeting with stakeholders, the RECSEC announced that persons who will patronize any beach in Accra must show proof of vaccination or will be vaccinated before gaining access to the shores. 
Regional Minister Henry Korti announced at a Security Council uh, meeting that officials of the Ghana Health Service and the police service will be there to enforce the new directive. Manuel Cranton has more in the following report. It, it is Christmas time and me and my family are at the beach having fun. We go to school the whole year and it's time for us to relax. That is eight-year-old Karin Asari, who has visited the La Pleasure Beach Resort with her family. 24 hours before now, it would have been illegal as a ban by the Greater Accra Regional Security Council on beaches was in force. Beyond denying kids like Karen the joy of hanging out with friends and family this holiday season, the ban hit hard at the beach operators, making them hundreds of thousands of cities in losses. Samuel Kuti is general manager of the La Pleasure Beach. People are buying drinks and vegetables so that we prepare. This, and the beach is basically about eating and drinking. But we collect, it's a tow collecting facility too. So why we have lost the tow collecting, we are, the bar and the vendors too have lost their daily bread because they have to sell food to the customers. So all the thing, as I'm talking to you, and some have spoiled. But that is about to end. Henry Corte is Greater Accra Regional Minister. The minister has been arrived at the game today by RECSEC. They can operate, but ensure that they adhere to the COVID safety protocols, that uh, as much as practically possible, people who patronize the place must show proof of vaccination. If they haven't vaccinated, Ghana Health Service are going to mount posts at entrances of almost all the beaches, and they will educate people and also vaccinate them. How will this be ensured? They said we should contact the uh, municipal health directorate so that they will bring their equipment from now to come to mount it at the gates. So anybody who comes in who has not vaccinated, then they will take the chance to vaccinate the person before you enter. So what is going to happen? Then we have to bounce you back. Okay. Uh, the directives from the regional minister is that the police should assist us to make sure all the protocols are adhered to. So uh, we will liaison with the La police uh, uh, command to, to help us do the job. We cannot do it alone. Although we have internal security also to enforce whatever we have to tell them, uh, we, are, we also rely on the police. We have the marine police also coming here. While the authorities work to enforce this, many of the revelers are excited that they get to unwind from a stressful COVID-19 year at the beaches. It's good news that uh, the, the ban has been released, that we can now go to or come to the, to the beach. I've come with my kids, as you can see, and we are having fun. And uh, I learned we are supposed to vac be vaccinated before you are allowed to come. It's a good news because the COVID is real. My family and I decided to um, come to the beach at the end of the year. When we got to Accra, there was a ban on the beach, but as we were moving around, we realized they had lifted the ban, so we decided to come here. But that wasn't going to be a problem. I think they did that because of the COVID. And that wasn't going to be a problem because we are, have, my family and I, we, we've all vaccinated. For now though, you're free to go to the beach. Just get vaccinated. Manuel Quentin, Joy News, Accra. And in a related development, government has reviewed its ambitious target of vaccinating 20 million citizens by end of year. Speaking in an interview with Forbes Africa, President Ekufado explained that the challenges with acquiring vaccines at the start of the year has forced government to change course. Well, the vaccines uh, the, recently, in the last months, two months, I think that um, access to them has been growing. I think that by the end of this year, the projections are that we would have received some 15 million vaccines. The 20 million target may not, we may not reach it by the end of the year, but we believe that we, by the, by the end of the first quarter of next year, would have attained it. And the significance of it is that I mean, the population of 30 million people, that's what we are, our latest census that we've just conducted has indicated that if we're able to vaccinate 20 million people, essentially we're vaccinating the entire adult population of Ghana. And that in itself builds up all the immunities within the population that we know about. So it's as a target, it's an important target. 
we believe that we will get well systematically we're getting closer and closer to realizing it in the process too we've taken some long term decisions we've been dependent on other people to provide us with vaccines that's an intolerable situation a pandemic that is affecting your population and you are not in a position to assist the population because you are having to beg other people to give you what they have it's not a situation that we can live with to some social projects now and work has begun on multimedia's classroom project using the hydrofoam technology. The project engineer Samuel Kofi Adbenyaga says work will be completed in one month. The multimedia classroom project is an initiative to explore philanthropy uh, for development at the community level. It is expected to provide safe learning environment for some 700 school children in the central and northern regions, project engineer Samuel Kofi Adbenega uh, has been explaining. This is Breman Jamre's ground zero. It was here four years ago that six children crashed to their death in a building collapse that shook the nation. Today, some of the children who survived that accident play in the leftover rubble. Joy News' coverage of the disaster moved non-governmental organizations to build the structure which now houses some of the children. That aside, not much has changed. This is the Jamra Roman Catholic School. It's only a few meters away from the Methodist school that collapsed. The scenes here are way too familiar. The building. Sometimes when someone just hits his hands on the wall, you see that the hole is shaking. And someone will say, hey, it's going to collapse, so it's coming to... Then you try to get out of the class. Someone will come and tell you that I dreamt, I dreamt that uh, the school has collapsed. So when you are sitting there, you say, hey, I don't want to sit near the corner. I don't, this one dreamt this, this, so... The cracks on the wall, that's made us think now the building is a death, death trap. And when it's, when the rain flows, the building shakes and we thought it is going to break and there's darkness in the room. When, when it is 10 o'clock going, our, the dark comes to our class because there was no windows in the class and the heat. When the teacher is teaching, we have to use books to find ourselves. Due to that, we cannot be concentrated. The school was put up largely by community members of Jamra. It is now run by the government and yet has seen very little infrastructure development. Much of the walls have open cracks and fallen roofs. Last year, villagers here worried it may come crashing down, pull down two classrooms, moving students to already congested spaces. This is the fourth public school in this community. This one here alone has close to 600 students. While so much has been done in the other schools to bring up infrastructure to match up the numbers, so much more remains undone in many of the other schools. This leaves many children like the vulnerable ones in here today studying at the peril of their lives. In the heart of the town, I have come to meet Nana Kwesi Enin III. He is the Krontihini of this small town. Years ago, everybody expected the government to do everything. Now, the demand on the government has increased. Um, so, uh, the years ago, expectation uh, cannot work now. The community is willing and ready um, to, as it were, provide communal labor to um, support any NGO, any philanthropist, any institution that will want to uh, come and uh, rebuild the school uh, building for us. 
The warning bells from February 17, 2017, when the school accident happened here, rings loud in the minds of these children. So that is what has necessitated the Join News Classroom project. We'll bring you the sound of the engineer who is on the site uh, right now, beginning with the work at Bremanjama shortly. Uh, but you can still support the classroom project in cash and in kind. For all your Momo transactions, you can send uh, your donations to 05930 That's the Multimedia Group Limited. Or you can call 302 211-680 for more enquiries. The Classroom Project, promoting social justice through philanthropy. The Classroom Project is brought to you with support from Star Ghana Foundation and funding by the Dutch Foreign Affairs Ministry under the Given for Change initiative. Let's do some other stories now. Ghana's first skating park has opened in Accra. The edifice, built in memory of fashion entrepreneur Virgil Abloh, who died uh, of cancer last month, was put up by volunteer staking players uh, by, uh, who have for years struggled for a place to practice the sport in a country where lesser-known games continue to fight for attention. Here's a report by Justice Bader. My name is Harmony Bataka. Uh, my friends call me Blue. I'm a skateboarder and I'm part of the collective surf Ghana. I've been skating for two years. Blue has always wanted a safe space where she could practice skating. And so when she had a call to be a part of the group of volunteers to build the Freedom Park, she jumped at it. Sometimes you want to skate, but mostly you don't have a lot of um, obstacles or things, different things to try with, you know. So mostly we just have flat ground. And but this has different things to try. So I'm going to try everything that I can here. It's not just flat, you know. So it's going to make me improve. Like many talents who play in the so-called lesser-known sports in Ghana, there's very little support for the game. My name is Daniel Soa. I'm a skateboarder, a skate coach, a filmmaker and a photographer. Many of the people part of this building, like Daniel, have had the experience of getting thrown out of makeshift places that they've created themselves to practice. So we usually used to skate the streets, um, in front of people's shops, empty spaces that were not used, National Theatre, the Trade Fair, and other demolished places like Mile 7 right now. We usually have a lot of problems using people's spaces because they are private spaces and they have problems with us skateboarding there. So we get kicked out most of the time when we do our own thing, but we always try and survive by trying to always find a new place until we had to get to this space. I believe that skateboarding I can definitely encourage youth entrepreneurship, um, develop also entrepreneurship in sport industry. And uh, Ghana, uh, because I was telling you, uh, has the most progressive skating uh, in West Africa. This dream has been brought to life with kind support from people far and near who, like the young people working here, want to get talent to take their craft beyond Ghana. Amongst them, Virgil Abloh, the creative fashion designer and entrepreneur who died last month from cancer. In his name, the Freedom Park has been dedicated. It's sad that he wasn't here himself to see what his work you know, had done. And yeah, but I'm sure that wherever he is, he knows that we are happy and we appreciate whatever it is that he did for us. It's a very, very big um, opportunity for people like me because we need to develop what we have as talents. So if we have spaces like this, that's going to help us grow and develop our talents to go where we want to go. It's really, really good for us because to become someone who wants to skate and go into like, let's say the Olympics or whatsoever, you need to be skating parks, transitions and other things like this. And, Getting access to it is the main thing that we needed. 
The global skateboard market size was estimated at 1.9 billion US dollars in 2019, reaching 2 billion in 2020. For the many Ghanaian skateboarders looking to play at the world stage and also earn from their craft, the Freedom Park would finally create a safe space so they too can reach the stars. Justice Beidou, Joy News, East Ligon, in Accra. And the multimedia group has officially announced the sudden death of the general manager of the Joy brand of the media conglomerate, Elvis Koku Kwashi, who died after a short illness. Management and staff have been sharing their fond memories of the man they affectionately called the real boss. Let's start with the chief human resource officer, Nana Elegba, who broke the news. Thank you, Emeka. Your audience. <clears throat> it's um, with a very heavy heart, very, very sad heart, that we have to announce the death of one of our own, Elvis Koku Kwashi, the general manager for our, our Joy Brands, who sadly went to be with the Lord on Tuesday night, late um, Tuesday night, um, at about um, just before midnight. And um, it has left all of us heartbroken. Um, we are in grief. Um, some of us are still in a state of shock. Some are still in a state of denial. Um, Elvis has been with the group um, for a very long time. Um, he rose through the ranks and um, became known as the face of Joy News, of course, working in the background, uh, directing as the managing news editor for years until he was elevated to the position of general manager in charge of all the Joy brands. Um, and he's such a fine gentleman. At this point in time, I had to go out to his wife um, Cynthia to his uh, three children, lovely children, um, young children. I had to go out to the entire family, the bereaved family, and we want to assure you that we will continue to support you. We want to give you our word. Elvis is one of our own. Um, I'm, I'm, it, it pains me to the core that I'm sitting here talking about him in past tense. Uh, none of this, uh, none of us saw this happening. It's, um, but it has happened for a reason. God knows why it has happened. Um, he said in all things we should give him thanks, so we give him all the thanks. Uh, on a very painful note, though, and we will continue to pray for the widow, we will continue to pray for the family, and in due course, once the family um, announces its program, um, we'll give you all the details, we'll share the details with you, our cherished uh, audience, in due course. Mm. Well, Nana, uh, thank you for that um, heartbreaking, heart-wrenching announcement. But... Elvis is loved and respected by all who worked with him. Exactly a year ago, the team members decided to appreciate his stellar leadership. We pulled the surprise for him. Quietly, we waited for him to walk in. A clearly astonished Elvis Kwashi wondered what was going on. The man who sees it all and knows it all was for the first time in the dark. <laughs> Staff then took turns sharing memorable moments with the Elvis Kwashi. First was host of the Pulse on Joy News, Gifty and Apia. Elvis gave me my first opportunity on Joy FM. Joy News editor Israel Lai, multiple award-winning journalist said Kwame Boateng and Chief Human Resource Manager Nanai Legba praised his remarkable commitment to the Joy brand. We all know that he's a jolly good fellow and uh, we say God bless him. And from 2013 to date of about 25 awards, thanks to his leadership. But we want to celebrate you while you are still alive. Channel manager for Joy News, Emily Yakung, ace producer, Bloody Souza, and head of Joy News political Dex Evans Mensa, followed sharing heartwarming stories about the encounter with Elvis Kwashi. 
He's been a great, great, great leader. I mean, and I must say this, and I'm not like bias here. One of the reasons why people like us have stayed for this long is because of Elvis. Spiritually, physically, you've been there. And I want to say God bless you. Amen. Amen. His leadership, we, we share a lot. It's guided me. It's brought me this far. And he will empower you. He will give you all the power you need to do whatever you do. And when it comes to defending, he's there to defend you. It was then time for the gifts to start pouring in. A citation was presented to him on behalf of the multimedia group. A theory assignment editor, Fred Smith, then offered him a special gift. He's made a very big impact in my life, uh, my professional life. In fact, I'll be dead by now if he had not come for me at the time he did. Full of appreciation, Elvis Kwashi extended his gratitude to the team. I'm very humbled by this. I feel so loved. I think it's time to quit. <laughs> <laughs> Well, tributes have been pouring in for Elvis Kwashi. The GGA president, Afo Moni, has been sharing his own memories of the man who transformed the Joy brand into a winning team, winning over 100 awards during his tenure. He received with an earth shattering shock the death of Elvis Kwashi. Um, this is a, a tragic loss of shattering circumstances, shattering consequences, and devastating um, effects on the media community in general and the family in particular. Elvis was not the loud type. Elvis will allow his work to speak, and he did his contribution, spoke, and he still speaks volumes about his professional solidity, his calm disposition, and his professional uh, contribution to journalism. If Joy FM finds itself on top of the pack of media outlets in Ghana, if Joy it's a reference point in journalism in Ghana and the rest of Africa. Because behind the scenes was a professional gem like Ebbe Kwashi, who will ensure that the crop of journalists deliver to the best of their ability and to the expectation of the um, teaming listeners who rely on uh, multimedia for their sources of information, news, and what have you. Ghanaian journalism has lost a colossal figure in Elvis Kwashi. And, and um, it's difficult to replace it now. Because Elvis. And some have taken to Twitter to tweet about the man we're celebrating today. The former president, John Germani Mahama, uh, posted on his Twitter page uh, celebrating Elvis Kwashi for his role as a professional and also uh, for ensuring that he did a great job when it comes to keeping the gate uh, as a media practitioner. It says, rest in peace, Elvis. I knew Elvis from my days as a young deputy minister for communications, especially uh, when as a young journalist he was assigned to cover parliament. He was a good person and his days with the multimedia group showed, uh, showcased his professional journalistic trait and a classic example of how to play the gatekeeping role as a media person. I was by his bedside briefly during his period of hospitalization and feel indeed sad that he was unable to pull through. We can only thank God for his life and my heart goes out to, uh, at this time, to his wife Cynthia, the children, family, and the multimedia group. 
We also have Sami Jainfi of the NDC saying, just hearing sad news of the passing of one of the gentle, noble and finest professional journalists I've ever met in my dealings with the media, Mr. Elvis Kwashi, General Manager of the Joy Brands and the Multimedia Group. On behalf of the National Democratic Congress, I wish to convey sincere condolences to his family and the Multimedia Group. May his gentle soul rest in perfect peace. This is extremely heart-wrenching. So rest in peace. We're taking a break here on Join News Prime. We'll bring you business and sports. Please stay with us. The Ghana Association of Bankers and the Chartered Institute of Bankers is meant to provide a common ethical and professional code of conduct for banking professionals. According to them, unethical practices uncovered threaten the stability of the financial sector and cost it billions of cities. Former principal at the National Banking College, Philip Boabing, gave some explanation to law business. Uh, it was fine out that, yes, the professional members within the banking industry are limited. Not all members, not all players within the banking industry are professional members or chartered bankers. But at the end of the day, the unethical conduct of any player within the industry will affect the industry. And that's the reason why that collaboration was sought, so that we have a common code. So that so long as you play within the banking industry, you abide by this code of conduct. So basically, it is the contents and the essence of this code of conduct that was introduced to our members here in Kumasi. He spoke at the 2021 Bankers Week Forum held in Kumasi. It was under the theme Ethics and Professionalism in the Ghana Banking Sector. Head of Banking Supervision at the Bank of Ghana, Osei JC, said the Code of Conduct will build back the confidence in the banking service. Adequate legislations have been enacted by the Bank of Ghana to regulate banking operations and to ensure a fair competitive environment. This notwithstanding, Regulations and penalties alone are not sufficient to ensure discipline in operations. Therefore, a high ethical standards are expected to guide operations in the banking industry. When the banks are working for profitability, certain ethical principles of the banking profession may be loosely applied. We believe that to enhance public confidence and trust in banks and pride within the banking profession, Individuals working in banking should make a personal commitment to a higher standard of professionalism. The Chartered Institute of Bankers is therefore charged to ensure implementation of most part of this initiative. Charles Ofuriakwa is a CEO. The code is for all, all practitioners, all practitioners. And um, the law is new, the regulation is even barely a month old. So industry is gradually doing the necessary stakeholder you know, uh, engagements to ensure that all practitioners uh, are enrolled as members of the institute in the various member category. You don't necessarily have to be a chartered banker to be a member of the institute. Uh -huh. So that is the trend in now and uh, discussions are still ongoing to get all practitioners, you know, to be members of the institute. All practitioners will come under the Ghana Banking Code of Ethics and uh, Business Conduct, uh, benefit from the banking education, leading to one becoming a chartered banker for those who wish to study, and then also having regular continuing professional uh, development. These are, uh, how do I say, retooling 
you know, um, um, sessions that we have for our members to be abreast with current, you know, uh, uh, issues. Meanwhile, stakeholder discussions and engagement are ongoing to ensure full implementation for high ethical standards. Prince Apia. The opening eight service centers across the country from next year. Of course, this comes amid fears of COVID-19 and the Omicron variant, of which uh, an expert from Carlton International, Pierre Dumago, has called for businesses and governments to implement measures to forestall the impact come 2022. Happening, I will not be surprised when we see other businesses also trying to shut down to save their staff from getting infected or, or to prevent the slowdown of their uh, business processes. I mean, MTN is, has kind of placed public health over profit. And I think mm. we should laud them for the action that they have taken. Some businesses would have allowed their staff who have tested positive to show up. They will come and also infect customers who are coming to do business. So I think that we don't need to chastise MTN for what has happened. I know very well that MTN has a, has a utility platform for which their subscribers and customers can use to resolve about 95% of their needs. And those remaining 5%, you may have to walk into the shop when services resume. And seriously, we are not in normal times. And so when some of these things happen, I think we need to kind of understand the, the service provider uh, because they are also concerned about life and uh, mean life as well. Well, but how strategic must government be uh, to minimize the impact on the business community, especially when we continue to see a surge in cases of Omicron, not just in Ghana, but across the world? I think for me, we've seen government has done a lot in terms of rolling out the vaccine. Unfortunately, most people have not gone for their shots and then they are kind of uh, putting burden on the public purse and hospital beds. So I think for what government has done is satisfactory. But I think that government still needs to do more. Uh, during this Christmas celebration, we were expecting government to come up with some measures. And once that place, you know that Noella is here with the very latest in the world of showbiz. Yes, Hello, Noella. Hi, uh, Ernest. How are you doing? I'm good. Yourself? I'm awesome. All right, what do you so have for us today? Right. So, you know, days ago, uh, musician Shatawali, mm -hmm. you know, held a concert at the stadium with his uh, very good friend, Medical. Yeah. And it was a well-attended concert. Well, well and in fact, during his performance, he was so overwhelmed with the mm -hmm. crowd mm -hmm. that he had a lot to say about Nigerian artists. In fact, he mentioned that he doesn't regard Nigerian artists and oh, really? you know had some unprintable words to say about them as well i can't really tell you exactly the words <laughs> he had to use that, obviously yeah. uh, but since that runs uh, a lot of musicians have been you know taking turns and you know sharing your thoughts on uh, what he had to say. A lot of people have sort of not condoned those comments. Mm -hmm. They have spoken against it. But uh, at Wilderland Festival, uh, KMJ had a conversation with Kwabna Kwabna, who says they may be an iota of truth in what Shatter had to say. My brother has ways of channeling his, his, his message. You know what I mean? But then, irrespective of how he channels his message, if we all look deep down into ourselves, we can find some iota of truth in what he's saying, but sometimes maybe the manner in which he put it, you know what I mean? But it still doesn't take away the fact that there are certain issues to be addressed. What happened to 8020? You know what I mean? So we all um, think that it's beautiful to welcome our neighbors, but then we need to have the lion's share. That's what it is. So that's uh, Kovna Kovna speaking there. We'll bring you more on this uh, later in our subsequent bulletins. You definitely uh, would want to watch out for that, but also on our social media platforms. Thank you very much, Noella. That's it for the bulletin. My name is Ernest Bene. We have more stories at myjohnline.com. Good night.